Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at something out of the Dungeon Master Guide. Hirelings and henchmen. Wait, what's that? Oh yes, hirelings and henchmen can be very important to your low-level D&D group. You, you bring in other people for their specialties, you pay them money, or maybe a cut of the treasure. I'm going to show how this can go right and go wrong for your low-level campaign. Hirelings and henchmen can also be used up through middle and high level as well. So we're going to take a look at hirelings and henchmen and decide maybe you don't need them, maybe you do need them. Uh, maybe they're good, maybe they're evil, who knows. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that, the pros and cons of having them, especially for a low-level party. And also I'm still running my uh, subscription drive, getting so close, almost to 1,000 is the make of this video. A little bit more and I'm over the top, so please, if you've been on the fence, just go ahead and subscribe and help me uh, hit my goal. Also, the Patreon, uh, in late May or early June, I'm going to be dropping the first of a serialized dungeon that I'm writing, based in the world of Greyhawk. And uh, it's going to be based on the campaign I'm starting up, or I have started up with my group, and have been running for the last couple of weeks. I'm not going to be an exact mirror of that campaign, because of course I'm going to change some stuff, but by and large it'll be... Uh, very close to what I'm running for my group, and uh, you can see how I prep my notes, and it's been an experience. I've never written a dungeon for someone else to read. I've only ever written my own notes, and I went through that process in a video a week or two ago. And uh, it's different to have to write everything down, so it's been a learning experience for me. But anyway, back to the topic at hand, hirelings and henchmen from the Dungeon Master Guide, today on page 121. All right, we're going to be looking at our good friend, the Dungeon Master Guide, for this one, page 24. And we're going to talk about hirelings and henchmen. Uh, nope. A little bit for past page 24. Here we go. Page 28. Sorry, my bad. Okay, so we've got the definition of hirelings and henchmen. I'm going to start with hirelings. And hirelings are the expert... Uh, that you hire. They are the, the porter, the carpenter, the leather worker, that kind of stuff. And the DMG goes into a great deal of information of how much they cost per day, per month, and then some more expert hirelings. These are professionals here and then experts here. So kind of interesting. You can even start working on your whole uh, army if you want. You can hire crossbowmen, heavy footmen, whatever. So that's the definition of a hireling, is the paid professional, and their profession is something that you would need. So uh, a teamster, a tailor, a valet, or at a, a more professional expert level, an alchemist, an armorer, uh, you know, blacksmith, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that the hireling is the more specific paid uh, paid a professional as opposed to a henchman which I'm going to get to in a moment so if for instance a sage I want to hire a sage and a sage is indeed a hireling someone I can hire but I'm hiring him for a, his expertise maybe in some field I want him to research the history of a sword I have found in a dungeon so I go ahead and I I hire this guy and I pay him X amount of gold uh, for a month, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to apply his skills and try to find out what he can about it. So that would be a good example of a hireling. Uh, sages get consulted a fair amount in my campaign. My players have always kind of used them, and uh, I've always encouraged it. I think it's a, a great thing. There was a really good dragon article expanding on the sage. Uh, I forget off the top of my head. I may take a look at that later on, but that's not really important to what I'm doing today. So right here, these are the experts. The other area that I often find my players is if they end up on a ship for some reason, especially if they end up as the masters of the ship, now they have to hire a ship's crew. I use this uh, extensively whenever I'm doing that. And again, there are other uh, resources out there for AD&D that have been published over the years. But today I'm just going to stay to what's within the Dungeon Master Guide. By the way, both these cartoons, are these are two of my favorites. The excellent This Had Better Work cartoon with the mice. My buddy liked that so much, he made up our uh, bunch of silk screen shirts for our group. 
with that cartoon on it. And then, of course, get the Barbarian in the corner, another drink, quick. So I like both of those. I always did. So a hireling is your expert employee. He's not going to go with you into the dungeon. He's going to ply his trade wherever he plies it. If he's a porter, he's going to carry your stuff to and from. If he's a sage, he's going to sit in his quarters and maybe do a little legwork in trying to research the project you have in mind, but that'd be it. He's not going to go in and fight with you in the dungeon. That's what henchmen are for. Henchmen are just that. You end up with a uh, group where your party is going to be only three people playing, uh, and you have a fighter, a magic user, and a cleric, or two fighters and a magic user, and you go, "Uh uh-oh, we don't have a thief. We better hire a thief. That would be a henchman. Oddly enough, in our game, for whatever reason, to this day, we have always referred to the henchman function, where you're hiring a professional to go into the dungeon with you, as hirelings. <clears throat> Don't know why we probably got started out of the original box set, but as recently as like a game ago, uh, we had somebody who was hired on who was referred to as a hireling, not a henchman. Henchmen never caught on with us for some reason. But they are indeed a henchman. And then you've got a lot of detail as to how much they cost per day and what chance you have of finding a prospective, you know, first level cleric that's going to go in with you. Maybe that cleric is a druid or you're going to have a fighter who's going to end up being a, either a ranger or a paladin you're going to be able to hire. And that's, that's fine. I, I have no issue with that. Generally at first level, uh, what the parties have done in, in my campaigns is they usually will pool their money and then hire uh, a henchman uh, say another fighter to come in and bolster, bolster their ranks as a fighter or, as I said, if you you don't have a thief and you need a thief. The important thing that I've always enforced in my game is that the henchman is a person. They're not going to just blindly go ahead and stick their head into that dark area in the demon's mouth to see what happens because they were told to by their boss. They're going to say no. And in some cases, they have their own agenda. Maybe they want some treasure that the party's gotten. Maybe they're purposely staying out of combat so they're fresh and ready to go while the party's weakened. I've done the occasional traitor uh, henchman. It could be a lot of fun. It can be devastating for a very low-level party, but I've done a few where the uh, party is, you know, third, fourth level, and they have a thief who's been with, with them since maybe first or second level, but eventually the thief finds enough that he turns coat and he steals from them, and he takes off, and now he becomes the MacGuffin for my next game, tracking him down, getting the item back. That can be a lot of fun when you've got a guy playing the inside man. Keep in mind, you don't have access to no alignment at first level, so it's gonna you're going to be taking a lot on trust. It goes so far as to say that it would be considered rude to ask your prospective hire anything about their ethics or religion. I find that kind of amusing. Um, I'm going to want to talk to the guy and see if he and I see eye to eye on different things like, you know, I don't know, just if we come across, you know, and are attacked by X number of goblins, are we going to defend ourselves and try to slay the goblins? Or is he going to stand there and try to talk the goblins into reason? What's our situation going to be? I just consider that prudent in being the hiring party. Uh, Again, we have a little antagonism between the book from the DM's perspective, and the players. Uh, it's also uh, written in here that it's in, you are not encouraged to charm person your hirelings because that's considered rude also. I've had plenty of parties go ahead and charm the hireling. Some cases it was warranted, some cases it never was. That's really going to depend a lot on your players and on their play style. I would never stop a party, even of good alignment, from casting a charm person as long as they weren't going to abuse that person while under the charm. In other words, convince them to walk into the dark room and uh, see what that monster wants over on the other side all by themselves, which they may do under a charm, depending on how it's worded, but they would definitely not do without the charm. So go to alignment party that tries to get a hireling to, to do, or a henchman to do something like that, then we have a problem. But if they just treat him as a normal member of the party, then I have no problem with the fact that he's been charmed just as a safeguard. They don't know him. Now, but keep in mind, at low levels, that also applies to the other players. I don't make my players reveal at a brand new game, I don't make them reveal what their alignments are. Uh, they have to tell their class, and uh, that's really about it. Class and race. 
Uh, but as far as alignment goes, that's really up to them to develop as they uh, role play. And if they want to keep that to themselves, well, that's no problem for me. Uh, so it can be the same thing. Then the other thing with henchmen is you have to decide how their what their function is in the party. So in the aforementioned uh, group where they didn't have a thief, they had a fighter, a magic user, and a cleric, for instance, and they hired this guy as a thief. Is he coming in as a paid employee? Or is he coming in and working basically on prospectus? Is he going to get a chunk of the cash involved? Will he get an equal share? So in my example, there are three party, three members of the party. They're bringing in the thief as a fourth. With the fourth member, the NPC, would he be entitled to a quarter of the treasure? Or would he just be paid a flat rate and get nothing of the treasure? Or maybe a little mix? Since the party is also funding a lot of the other expenses with the group, such as rations and equipment for each other and things like that, uh, it's not unreasonable to say, okay, Mr. Thief, you're coming in, but you're not getting a 25% cut. You're getting a, a 10 to 15% cut simply because you didn't front any money for this. We did, so we're going to get a bigger cut. That, again, that's between your players and you as the NPC, however you want to work it. I have always found treating a henchman fairly pays you dividends. Uh, if you include them and, and give them the occasional magic item, whatever your arrangement with them, uh, you tend to have an NPC that behaves more favorably to you when they're in a situation where you're really wounded and they might be able to just leave you. So now we get to the loyalty of the henchmen and allied creatures. I will take a look at this stuff, but I generally will not let Dice decide that for me. I'm going to decide the alignment of the individual before he's even brought out. I'm going to decide how he's going to behave, and I try to build in some flavor, but importantly, in Melee especially, I don't run the NPC. One of the players does. They choose between them who is going to be the one responsible for maintaining what the, the NPC is doing. I don't think it's fair for the DM to be settled with running the entire game and then doing every bit of combat for the NPC. So we'll turn that over to one of the players, and the, the player then is responsible for saying, well, the, their initiative goes now, they swing at their sword, they shoot a ball, whatever they're going to do. So I actually had a party years ago where the player characters came into some cash early as kind of a, a thing I was doing in the game. They didn't get experience points for the cash, so they were still low level, but they were pretty flush. So I had a party that was about first to second level, and they were able to hire like a third level fighter and a third level thief. That was kind of fun, actually, because the thieves were actually more skilled than they were, yet the players were richer than the thief and the, the fighter they hired, and I, fortunately for the party, ended up uh, rolling a neutral good and a chaotic good for them, so that thief being neutral good and the, the fighter was chaotic good, so they didn't have any conflicts with them, but it was a situation where, theoretically, the fighter and the thief being stronger could have taken advantage of the party and just killed them and taken their stuff. So, I have had that... Uh, I've had thieves slip away, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, NPCs slip away during a fight uh, to run for it, to be cowards. Uh, I've had them also die gallantly for a party. You can also use henchmen even at upper levels. There's nothing wrong with a 7th level uh, magic user hiring a 4th or 5th level fighter basically as a bodyguard. And again, the charm person, that's up to your individual players. That's up to you as the, as the DM as to whether you're going to allow that or not. I have no issue with it as long as the party that's been charmed does not have its situation, the charm, taken advantage of and have them go into situations they wouldn't have gone in otherwise. So that's really all I've got to say about henchmen and hirelings. I still think it's funny that we've always called henchmen hirelings. Uh, no idea why. Probably something to do with the original box. And uh, over the years, it's just stayed in my vocabulary and uh, rubbed off on my players. Although people I've played with in other groups have routinely referred to what would probably be a henchman as a hireling. So I really don't know where that came from. It's just kind of fun. So it's henchman and hireling in your brand new D&D campaign. They can be great. They can be a great source of story for you as the, the dungeon master. They can be a uh, great resource for the player characters or a great problem for them. It really all depends on how they're treated and how you as the DM decide they're going to act. So that's all I've got to say today on page 121. I thank you for uh, watching. I hope you liked what you heard and saw. If you did, please like and subscribe. Remember, I'm still doing the 
subscription drive. Also got the Patreon that will be coming up in late May to early June. Uh, so please check that out. I, I will let that know, let everybody know when that drops. I'll do an announcement when that drops. Um, but that's all I've got to say today for page 121. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.